to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to IEP Radio. That's Indoor Environmental Professional Radio. And this is episode five. Today, we're going to be talking with Chris Kresser, a little bit more about him in a second, but we're going to be focusing today on health of the home, right? That's, that's what a lot of us indoor environmental professionals look at one way or the other. And health of the body, right? Diet, nutrition, lifestyle, all those good things. And kind of how they all interrelate, especially from more of like a chronic, ongoing, long-term uh, viewpoint. Um, Chris is a really good friend and colleague of mine. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, uh, here's a little bit about him. He is a licensed uh, acupuncturist, uh, the co-director of the California Center of Functional Medicine, where he is a licensed integrative clinician. He is the founder of Cresser Institute, the creator of chriscresser.com, and a New York Times bestselling author of The Paleo Cure and Unconventional Medicine, which I have a copy here right in front of me. He is one of the most respected clinicians and educators in the field of functional medicine and ancestral health and has trained over 400 clinicians and 350 health coaches around the world in his unique approach. Chris has appeared as a featured guest on Dr. Oz, Fox and Friends, and in other national media outlets. He does live in Berkeley, California with his wife and daughter, and as I mentioned, I consider him a friend, a mentor, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with him today. Welcome to the show, Chris. Appreciate it. Mike, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is going to be exciting. Um, there's a lot that I wish we could cover in the time that we have, and it, 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 I know we're not going to be able to do that, but um, I think the focus today for the listeners is that we're trying to talk about the relationship between the body, uh, diet, lifestyle, that sort of thing, uh, and also home and exposure, uh, and how they all kind of interplay and how, they, and how one thing may affect the other. So to kind of set the stage just a little bit for the listeners, um, you know, this is IEP radio. So, you know, naturally 99.9% of the clients that I work with, the people I talk to, we're, we're, we're focusing on the indoor environment. Um, admittedly, I do work with people where we're looking at chronic exposures or low dose exposures. Maybe it's mold, maybe it's bacteria, um, other things like that, chemicals, VOCs, that sort of thing. But one of my decision-making pivot points, if you will, that I try and identify or recognize with my clients is their health. Um, for example, how does their health affect how they will otherwise react in the given environment that we're looking at? And their environment is typically their home, but it can be anything. It could be their office or, or whatever. It can be a shopping market. Um, or how might I, as an IEP, assess their home differently? Or what, what may I look for that I wouldn't if they didn't have a chronic illness? But this pivot point, uh, the chronic disease, chronic illness, call it whatever you want, as I've learned from you and others, uh, affects many. I mean, the numbers, uh, for example, in your book, which I've been reading, by the way, great book, Unconventional Medicine. Thank you. You bet. You mentioned that one in two Americans uh, has now has a chronic disease and that one in four has multiple diseases. Th this is staggering. I mean, this is not like one in a thousand people or one in no. 10,000. These are numbers that I don't remember hearing as a kid uh, growing up about chronic illnesses, not that I was paying attention at eight years old. But they weren't that way when you were a kid. It's growing and right. growing fast. And maybe that's where in lies the meat, no pun intended, of where some of this may go, of what I wanted to discuss with you. Um, with those type of numbers, how critical, how influential do you really think diet and lifestyle plays a role in how a person will respond to any given environment, whether it's labeled contaminated or not? It, it makes all the difference in the world. I mean, we know this was another statistic in the book, but 90% of chronic disease is driven by diet, lifestyle, and behavior. There's only about 10% of chronic disease or diseases in general are, are driven primarily or exclusively by genetics. So, you know, we know of certain genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis where if you have the gene, you, you will have the disease. It doesn't matter how well you eat or whether you exercise or whatever, you've got the gene, you've got the disease. But in most cases, that's not, that's not what happens. It's, we have genes and those genes may predispose us to developing certain conditions, but it's those, gene, those genes will only express or be activated in the presence of certain environmental influences. So the way I like to explain it to people is like, if you take 100 
peop, humans and you drop them in the modern environment, people are going to develop different reactions to that. You know, some people will get diabetes, some will get cancer, others will develop heart disease, others will develop autoimmune conditions. And that's driven by genes, you know, the, the, the predisposition to how exposure to a particular set of environmental influences will manifest or unfold is driven by genes, but it, it's the environmental influences that makes those conditions manifest in the first place. Right. And so does that, that, that bit of information, are, are we talking just to keep myself on track? Is that the 90% you're, you have the people that no matter what they're going to do, no matter what they're going to, how, how fit they are, they're going to have this predisposition but there's still 90% of the people. And I mean, I know we're using broad strokes here, but I mean, I've walked into, here's the dilemma. I walk into a number of homes where the, the exposure in the home isn't obvious. And I know that you could go into on a whole nother uh, topic on well, what is perfect, what is ideal of a home. But let's just say that many people have assessed the home and they can't find anything. Even mm -hmm. there's proactive measures, uh, scrubbers, uh, fresh air being brought in, um, the products and building materials are being checked, all these things. I still hear people um, complain about, uh, you know, they don't feel well. And some of these people, and this is where I'm treading lightly, I have made my own observations that their dieting or the, the choice of food that they have mm -hmm. are showing or displaying is mm -hmm. more typical to the kind that I grew up with, which is not exactly... It, it was the pyramid diet. It was, right. yeah. so that's got to play a role, right? Certainly. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, we have these genetic predispositions, but they only manifest under certain conditions. And unfortunately we live in a modern environment where there are multiple threats to our health and well being. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, what, what I've argued for some time and evolutionary biologists argue is, is there's a mismatch between our genes and our biology, which is essentially, if you want to use a computer analogy, our hardware, you know, what, what, uh, what we, what, what our hardware is, is, is suited for and the software that we're trying to run today in this modern environment. You know, we human beings and our hominid ancestors going back two and a half million years evolved in an environment where we were eating primarily meat and fish, wild fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and some starchy plants. We were uh, not sitting for long periods. We were walking 10 to 15,000 steps a day and had you know, brief periods of intense physical activity. Um, we lived in the natural rhythms of light and dark. There was no artificial light and certainly no iPads and, and phones in our bedroom and exposure to brightly bright screens at night, which interferes with our circadian rhythms. We lived in tribal close knit social groups. Um, we had a lot of leisure time and play and that, you know, that you can think of that as our nat our, our, our natural software, you know, that that's, those are the environmental inputs that human bodies expect and evolved in the presence of. Yet we're and not providing anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, and it's a pretty dramatic shift, especially if you think about it on the evolutionary timescale. We're really talking about only the last 100 years or 150 years where, you know, we've developed artificial light and a highly processed and, and refined food, and, you know, industrial uh, seed oils and flour and sugar became major parts of our diet where 60% of the American diet now is consists of ultra processed food, not just processed food, but ultra processed food. Have that ultra in there. Give me more. Uh, <laughs> more. Um, where we're now, you know, a third of Americans is now getting fewer than six hours of sleep a night, which is up from just uh, 1%, I think, in, 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 the fifth, in the 1950s. So that's a pretty profound change in the last you know, 60 years, 70 years alone. So you have these massive changes that for us might not seem that dramatic because it's the only life that we've known. Um, but even our grandparents, you know, if we talk to them, they, they could tell us how different their life looked. And if certainly their grandparents were living a really different life. And the key thing to understand about that is, is our genes cannot have not kept pace with, with the chain, with these changes. Um, you know, we're talking about a few generations and significant genetic changes. You, know, you take many, many generations, um, to, to happen. And I don't, it's, it's hard for me to envision a genetic change that would enable us to thrive on big gulps and, and cheese doodles because they, they just don't provide the nutrition that human bodies need. And even if they did, um, 
even if your body could do that, do it so quickly. I mean, our right. evolution of where we're at today yeah. versus, you know, depending not on anytime doing. soon. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, by that time, we'll probably be like living in the cloud and with, with synthetic bodies and who knows what if, you know, but that, that's a whole nother discussion. So at, at a risk of, of, of sounding, um, well, I don't want to say stupid, but you know, so let's talk about those people then that don't necessarily have a, a genetic predisposition, but they're just not, they're living the typical American diet. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you, have you seen in your practice um, people that complain about exposures in their home? In other words, they, something is triggering a response, a negative response in their home. It's a symptom. It's something, uh, you know, there's a list a mile long. Um, and you can really attribute it to their diet, uh, again, meaning that there's nothing so obvious, but when you change their diet, all of a sudden, when they went into that same home, the problems went away. That's a good question. I, I can't think of a lot of examples like that, but, I, but you have to remember that I don't have a lot of patients who are following a standard American diet. You know, by the time that people end up in my clinic, it's, you know, it's kind well, maybe of- Maybe that's yeah, the answer. It's maybe kind of- yeah, I mean, it's, they, I don't get people who are just off the street. You know, I, 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 I do have a few handful of patients maybe who are doing that, but my typical patient is someone who's been following my work for some time, or they're at least, you know, they've been to several doctors, they've tried a whole bunch of things, including special diets, um, and, and that haven't been effective. And what I would also say is that we're always looking for the cause or the, the one thing. Um, and I don't know if that's true in your field, but it's true in mine. Um, I know and, that's what the clients want. <laughs> yeah. And in my experience, it's really more typically a combination of smaller issues that, that can combine to create a bigger, a big problem. And so for example, you take someone who's fought, you know, on a standard American diet, but then they're also sleeping only five hours a night and they're sedentary for most of the day and their stress level is off the charts. You know, they, they, they're like working two jobs and they've got a family and um, maybe they also uh, were exposed to lead when they were growing up and that never got dealt with and they have a chronic infection. Uh, uh, maybe they have H. pylori or a reactivated viral infection and then they get develop a water leak in their home <laughs> or or perhaps they go they move into a home that has that, that was built you know in 2017 and it has new paint and new carpets and all of this sort of thing so there's not like you said not an obvious problem like a water leak or mold issue or something like that but they there are these you know high levels of, of vocs and maybe without the crappy diet lack of sleep lack of exercise and chronic infection, or maybe even without two or three of those things, they would have been okay. But when you add all those things up, all it takes is that final, uh, you know, s straw to, d to just push the whole thing over. And, yeah, I, they, I, and that's the way bodies work, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's what I, 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 to agree with you, that's what I see from a non-medical standpoint is that it's funny too, not just that it's, it's a bunch of things. Cause even like just speaking of my own experience, like I grew up in an industry in a, in a, I don't know, in a family where everything was a worry from the standpoint of acute, like don't step out in front of a car because it will cause immediate pain or worse. And, and we never, chronic wasn't even a term, you know, the first time I heard chronic, it was a, a Dr. Dre reference. It, it was not, it wasn't what I've learned, you know, as the years have gone by and, and, but certainly with the, with the, as many clients as I see, it's surprising to me how many of them discount these issues, their diet, their lifestyle, genetic things, or things that haven't been diagnosed, which I, I can't really blame them for that, or, or discounting, like, for example, um, the moldy basement that they have and that they grew up with it. It's always been a musty smell, um, but must, everything is okay because, you know, it was just, it kind of was just labeled as suck it up. You're just, you got a headache and it was blamed on other things like you had a bad day at work or it certainly wasn't looked at through the lens that we're looking at today. And we're seeing more of it because the homes that we lived in, even in the fifties um, are not the same as the houses that we're living in today where they're built tighter. They're built with cheaper materials. And a lot of times those cheaper materials have um, chemicals 
um, and processes that can create um, an exposure, chemical or otherwise, or when they get wet. And a lot of us, uh, those uh, you and I personally and those listening, I, I'm sure are familiar with it's kind of like that snowball effect. So yeah, I see it usually being a multitude of things. It's always been a challenge, Chris, honestly, just trying to figure out how do you prioritize it? That's the the trillion dollar question. And I say trillion because that's easily how much uh, chronic disease is costing us probably more. Um, and th- I, I wish I had a perfect formula for you. And if I did, I would be a trillionaire. Right. Um, there isn't an, an easy answer to that, but I would say that in my experience, um, there is a kind of hierarchy of things that I tend to focus on first. Diet is really the number one because um, even if you have things like Lyme disease, which is a very serious infection, uh, my, my partner and co-director at the clinic, Dr. Sanja Schwag, he's a Lyme specialist, and he will focus a lot on diet and gut health right off the bat, even with people with chronic Lyme, because what he's found is that if you don't, if those things aren't dialed in, then no matter what you do with antibiotics or antimicrobials to address the infection, it's not going to be as effective because you don't have that healthy foundation. Again, right. you know, use another analogy. If you what you know really like if you're building a house you don't start thinking about the finishes and what kind of bathtub you're going to have and all of that until you've got the you know the really solid foundation there and right. everything else comes after that and so i would say for that is diet gut health uh would be number 2 and that's so important when you're dealing with any kind of expo- toxic exposure because it often affects the gut and the way that we eliminate toxins one of the ways is through the the, the GI tract uh, and the gastrointestinal system, which includes the liver and the gallbladder. Um, and cholestyramine, of course, which is one of the main binders used in the Shoemaker protocol, um, binds to bile acids and, you know, and, and that's, one of, that's one of the mechanisms of action. So um, gut health it would be number two. And number three would be uh, the HPA axis, so hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that 10 times fast audience, <laughs> 10 times fast. So this is, this is really the system that's most affected by, and also most governs our uh, response to stress. And so if you're not sleeping, if you're burning a candle at both ends, if you have a lot of exposure, artificial light at night, and you're not getting much exposure to natural light during the day, your HPA axis is what's going to go down. So if you get the diet dialed in, if you get gut health sorted, and then you um, make sure you're getting enough sleep and managing your stress and managing your exposure to light, that's, that's half the battle in my experience. And then you can start looking at other things like indoor air quality and heavy metal exposure and chronic infections and hormones and stuff like that. But um, there's no point in my experience of going on to those things if you haven't addressed those foundational factors. And I doubt that this is something we can stay from a, say from a statistical perspective, but just having some conversation right now, I think in general, what you're implying is that if it's the same exposure in an environment, all things being consistent, that a person who's not getting uh, taking care of their diet, their gut health, and the uh, say the th- ten thing times fast nail, the HPA. Um, if they're not taking care of that, that you wonder if everything else is consistent. If they may not have a worse reaction in that environment, and I think this is an eye-opening thing for me because, admittedly, I don't really walk into a client's home or their office and and talk about their diet. Yeah, and and I'm well, I'm suggesting, and I I don't want to get too far ahead. I know we'll talk a little bit about it, but. Um, I feel like that should be one of those first things you check off on your site assessment when you're working with clients in the field. Yeah, it's tricky. I do talk to them about their indoor air quality. Well, see, so you're doing your part. I'm not on mine. (laughs) It takes a village. And this is a new thing, by the way. You you and I, we have a little bit of history going back to 2015. And I know that I've worked with you. And um, it's been an eye-opening experience because a lot of times when we're working with clinicians and even trying to find Um, how do I say this? There's a difference between working with a clinician who uh, practices um, conventional medicine versus functional medicine, root cause versus, you know, treating the symptoms, all that. I think you have a clue about that. Um, But to our listeners, um, 
And then also trying to balance, okay, so what do you want me to focus on, clinician, uh, in the field? What do we know about this particular, uh, you call them patient, uh, that, that maybe we want to focus on? And maybe that's how I can kind of switch our focus just a little bit. Um, if I was to ask you, how can IEPs help your clients or your practice? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just mean, holistically, what are the, the top few things that you're hoping an IEP can address in a given home for the type of people you work with? Yeah, I'd love to answer that. Let me just step back and say, offer a, a, a piece of unsolicited advice here. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, health coaching is a new, relatively new field that's growing quickly. And I think one of the reasons I'm excited about it is there's so many potential applications. So uh, the scenario that you mentioned where you go into a client's house and you're there to assess their, um, their, their home and in, in some ways I like to call what you do a functional me medicine kind of assess, it's equivalent to functional medicine like what IEPs do for a home, you know, try to get to the root cause of the problem and figure out what's going on. Um, you know, they, they may not have hired you to give them dietary advice, uh, but you know, in your role of assessing their home and the, and the, the things that impact their health, it's some, if you teamed up, for example, with a health coach, that might be an interesting partnership because over time, you know, when you, uh, you start to develop a relationship with a client and they get to know you a little bit better, there might be an opportunity in there to say, oh, I've got this really fantastic health coach that I work with. They've been really helpful for a lot of my clients, you know, just offering their information in case you you'd like to talk to them like well, that, what, what about that me a pretty cool relationship what about me uh, let's say that i'm an iep which yeah. i am yeah and we become health coaches absolutely absolutely i mean that then is up to you whether you want to wear both of those hats and whether or whether you uh would prefer to just partner up with someone who's doing that but either way there's absolutely nothing stopping you from becoming a health coach and that would be a pretty cool service to offer well people. and and whether or not i'm a liaison to um speak a, an amb or an ambassador to speak the message and 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 through learning and i know that you do uh health coach uh, training which i'm not trying to turn it into an infomercial but i trust you uh, no 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 i mean I, the reason i bring it up is uh, it's i think in the uh, if we're talking about diet and lifestyle change, it's not necessary to see a functional medicine practitioner. Um, I mean, it may become necessary at some point if they need to work on the gut health and, you know, stuff that requires lab testing. But for a lot of people, that's out of reach financially. There aren't very many of us, unfortunately, certainly not enough. And I think it's a lot easier and faster to train health coaches to be able to be out there working with people like you or personal trainers, et cetera. Um, to give this kind of information. So just a thought, I think it's an interesting new model that's going to become more prevalent in the future with this and, and a lot more partnerships like this um, are going to be really valuable. Well, so you want to No, go for it. I was, well, I was just going to segue and say, can you, can you tell me and, and our listeners, if we are interested, where, where does somebody like myself start. I literally want to get off this podcast when we're done and I want to go sign up or learn more. Where can I go? Oh, just go to CresserInstitute.com and there's uh, info on, the, on, the, on our health coach training program there. All right. Sorry but, to interrupt. No, no, no problem. So um, what was the question before I well, got sorry. diverted there? <laughs> well, no, but you started it off good. Um, it's, it'll, it's, it's my fault for interrupting. It, I was asking you uh, through your eyes, yeah. If you know about IEPs, you've had experience yourself right. with it, not that you're bragging about that. Um, what would you say are important things for that IEP to look at for your patients? We understand that bringing in the health part of this that we just, I mean, I'm already adding that to my list. Let's just be clear. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other tidbits you can offer? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'll just give you a recent example. So, we had a patient yesterday who... Um, has been dealing with some health challenges for some time. We addressed the gut and the HPA axis stuff and the, the diet, uh, which she was already doing pretty well with before she came to see us. And she definitely improved, you know, maybe 30, 40% improvement, which is not in, insignificant, but it was still struggling. And in doing the, you know, we do a very detailed um, intake with new patients and we, we ask them questions related to their exposure to things like mold and, you know, 
we have a whole section of questionnaire. Do you notice musty smells in your home? Do you notice a change in your health when you move from one environment to another? You know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she kind of lit that whole section of the questionnaire up. And so then we did a visual contrast sensitivity test uh, That's and a biotoxin illness survey from the Shoemaker protocol. And that's, those are our two initial screening tools when somebody indicates that they may have had exposure in the past that's affecting them. She had like a 45%, I think, uh, total score on the VCS yeah. and maybe like a 40% biotoxin. So not only fail, but like big, you know, significant fail. Right. Um, and then the biotoxin illness survey was positive. So we went ahead and did the markers. Um, so I don't know if your listeners are familiar with these, but there are a number of biomarkers that um, indicate an active innate immune response in, uh, that is suggestive that the mold exposure is either ongoing or their response to it is ongoing. Uh, that's a key uh, point because at this stage we don't know whether they are currently exposed and that's what's triggering the reaction or whether the exposure was from the past and is 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 they're stuck in that response uh, her c4a was i think around seventeen thousand, which is very high she had high tgf beta one her mmp9 was 1200 one of the higher ones that i've ever seen uh, don't worry if you're not familiar with these markers they all just point to a general state of immune freak out basically yeah, it's not going to be a quiz here and inflammation you know significant reaction measurable documented um so sh you know sometimes and maybe we'll get into this it's a little unclear what's going on and you know they might test positive for a couple markers and the vcs is normal and there's not a history of clear exposure for this patient it was like they're checking all the boxes there that that textbook serves patient um, and then, as you as you well know, Mike, uh, step one of the protocol is removal from exposure. <laughs> so, how do we know if someone's exposed? You know, most people you can't just ask the patient if you're a functional medicine practitioner, are you exposed to mold? <laughs> um, most people have no idea how to evaluate that and how to answer that question. So, um, that's where we bring, you know, we uh, re rely on IEPs. And so depending on where the patient lives, I'll either have them contact you. I, I often have them do that anyways, if they're not local, because you've been really helpful in advising them. Uh, if they're in California, we have a couple people who can come locally or maybe uh, we coordinate with you to see if you're making a trip out there. Um, but that's, that's where I want an IEP involved because I don't want a, a patient going on Amazon and ordering the five dollar mold test kit and, and mold grew on it. There might be a problem, right? <laughs> you know, and about and and answering that the question of whether they're exposed um, with that kind of thing. This is where a professional really needs to come in, and there's a big opportunity here because there just as there are not enough functional medicine providers, there are not, in my experience, enough qualified IEPs who I really feel confident in referring patients to. And maybe that's, um, uh, I'm looking at my notes here, that is a perfect segue into this idea of what is an ideal uh, IEP because a lot of us know basic tests. And uh, I guess before I jump into that real quick, um, you've certainly acknowledged and uh, made comment about some of the great things that Shoemaker has provided uh, the protocol. There's some BCS and some other markers. Um, but I also want to say in fairness to your practice and like the practice of a lot of other physicians, clinicians I work with around the world, that some of them have found different approaches that ultimately are helping their clients that may not fit the perfect shoemaker protocol model. Um, here's the question. Uh, one of the ways that the IEPs that do work with uh, CIRS and that's uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And there's usually a little dash that people forget about it. CIRS dash WDB or water damage building. Um, it doesn't just mean a roof leak or a plumbing leak. It can be a damp building or if you live in a coastal climate or a tropical climate, uh, that's, a, that's another podcast. But um, we, one of the tools, one of the uh, sets of ancillary data that we find for the home is the People know it as the ERMI sample. And we hate saying it today like that because every time you use the word ERMI um, to describe uh, a dust sample, a lot of folks think that we're talking about the e e EPA-derived interpretation of it, which we are right. not. 
we are simply talking about the version that Dr. Shoemaker uh, created this way of interpreting it to determine whether or not, um, well, under step one of his protocol, is this a safe house to be in or not? And from a statistical standpoint, so the question is, do you follow that part of the, the are there other tests that you th- are seeing incoming uh, mycotoxin samples, uh, bacteria samples, anything like that that you find are helpful? Um, not really uh, at this point. I mean, those, I'm, I'm interested in any new testing that's validated. I think there's a lot of testing out there that's not validated. I'm, I'm not a big believer in urine mycotoxin testing. Uh, I, I don't think it makes sense mechanistically and I haven't seen any peer reviewed data to support it. Um, and yeah, I, I, as, as you know, we've chatted about this, I have some reservations about some of the, of the markers, um, that, that we use to detect SIRS. I, I, um, or let me put this a different way. What I'm not certain of is whether the the constellation or group of markers together are always indicative of SIRS versus some other condition where they can collectively be out of range that has not yet been identified. That's right. And, and, you, and you can even see that sometimes, in, uh, and it doesn't take too much when you just have inconsistent data like a, a VCS that tests that maybe passes or an ERMI or a hurts me score that passes, but everything else fails or any combination uh, it's not a perfect template for everybody, and we're we unless we have like some sort of a um, it's not X-ray vision, but unless we can peer into that person's soul, we're not exactly going to know what makes them tick down to the to the last well, DNA. Set. Here's another scenario, um, or a couple scenarios. So, like I mentioned, there's we had just now the textbook patient. Um, and we don't yet know if she'll have the textbook response where you do cholestyramine and other interventions, maybe all the way up to VIP and the, and the markers go down and their symptoms get better and they improve. But, you know, imagine someone who comes in and um, in the course of, you know, maybe we treat them for a number of different things. They're not really getting better and they don't have a clear history of mold exposure they don't have, uh, they can't point to, hey, I moved into this building and that's when everything went crazy and got worse. Um, they don't have any noticeable response or worsening of symptoms when they walk, you know, go into a building that's noticeably moldy. Um, they don't feel better when they're not in obviously moldy buildings. They don't feel better when they leave their home environment and, you know, go to Tucson uh, or some dry place for a while and then feel worse when they come back. But, you know, maybe we run and then they, they take the VCS and it's, it's not positive. Um, but we've learned in our practice that a lot of people who do go on to test positive for the SERS biomarkers don't fail the VCS. Um, and I've suspected that maybe that's because of the good nutrition that they're getting that might compensate for some of the and visual contrast. Um, but say we go ahead and do the SERS markers in that patient anyways, because we're not, you know, fi- figuring out what's going on and we want to see if there's, if there could be something to that. They test positive for all the SERS markers. Then we have an IEP come out and look at their house you know, good one like you or someone else and they can't find anything. They're, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's very difficult to completely rule out a problem as you well know with hundred percent certainty, but from the best of our ability, we can't see any problem in their current environment. So, so what's this, what's happening here? We got a person who's meets the definition of SIRS. They got four or more of these markers present. So then we decide empirically, you know, even though we can't see exposure in their current environment, we think it might have happened in the past. They're testing positive for the markers. So then we go ahead and do the protocol. Absolutely nothing happens. You know, their symptoms don't get better and the markers don't change. What, what, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at SIRS as it's been defined? Um, or is there maybe some other condition, some type of autoimmune disease, for example, or some type of chronic infection or something that we don't even know about or understand yet that is leading to the elevation in these markers that has not yet been identified. And that's why the treatment isn't working. Yep. And that's, 
Gosh, if there's a point to be made uh, right here, especially for the listeners, is that this is the struggle of trying to to work. Uh, this is tip of the spear stuff. I mean, this is we've come a long way. There is some pretty cool scientific stuff, uh, some testing uh, nerd type stuff we can do. You know, really crazy ways of detecting contaminants in the home. But it doesn't always. It's not like we have a cheat sheet that says, ah, you know, this many parts per billion or this these many spores or these many fragments. Um, are present and this is why you based off of your DNA are having this reaction. So it really is frustrating and inspiring <laughs> to continue the journey to get better because, and I think I'll segue into the, this idea of what can an IEP do to help here with what we've been talking about is certainly bringing up to the table and learning more about the importance of diet and gut function and, and health and HPA but also um, to understand that there is a big difference between chronic illness, chronic exposure versus acute. And the industry mentality is, uh, you say that there's a challenge sometimes even in your area of Berkeley uh, and some of the outlying cities, towns that you obviously have um, patients everywhere, but in that area that you don't have, that you have the typical mold inspector there's so many examples to give. I'll just choose one uh, where they go out there. They don't really listen to the history. They don't really, they do, you know, they, they go around with an infrared camera and they're saying, I don't see any water, which that doesn't even make sense because it's not looking for water. Um, they do a few air samples, but they don't explain the limitations of the air sample to the client. Um, and the client's just along for the ride. It's like a roller coaster. They're just yeah. kind of hooking them up and hoping it's all going to work out. Um, but there, there should be a lot of education. Um, and that's another point is, there's a, there's a lack of education being brought to the client. You know, it's like, I don't expect when I talk to you, like, I don't think you expect me to know what you know about diet and lifestyle. I expect yeah. that, you know, there's some basic things I can connect, but I'm here to listen. And you do such a great job educating people when you're on that, that, that topic. I feel like that's what's missing. You'll have a, an inspector come out with their blinders on. They'll turn on this pump. They'll collect a sample and then they'll make comments like this. Uh, we didn't find anything, you're safe. Yeah. And at first, the, the, how do they know that they're safe? Are they, right. are they qualified? Uh, yeah, this is well, that's a, like a patient coming into me who say, I feel horrible and I do uh, one blood test and look at their cholesterol and their blood sugar and, and it's normal and they say, you're safe, which is actually what happens a lot to patients when they go to the doctor and right. they feel horrible. I'm sure a lot of listeners can, can relate to that. And they're like, no, I'm not okay. I don't care what those lab tests say. I'm clearly not okay. Right. And, uh, you know, I, we, I'm sure a lot of people who've had a kind of standard um, environment, indoor environmental assessment have been in that same boat where they, they know without a doubt. You know, they come home to their house after being away and they feel worse. They're waking up, sneezing at, where, which, where they never did in their previous home. They know something is wrong. Somebody comes and does a test and says, I can tell you're, you're safe and, and you're imagining this, which is another thing that doctors have uh, unfortunately told people for many, many years, like this is all in your head. So right. yeah, there's a lot of parallels for sure. Um, yeah. Or, or not even, yeah. um, you know, not to beat a dead horse, but this happens so much, Chris, uh, it, it, misinterpreting qualitative data versus quantitative. And a classic example of this is like a tape lift sample. You have a situation, whether they bought it, you know, a, a online, uh, their own kit, or they had an inspector come out where they will, um, you know, visual person here, take a tape lift, uh, they get the mold on there and they did identify mold. And then the interpretation of that data just, it's like that game, it's, it's even worse than the game telephone where everyone sat in a circle by the time you say what it is and by the time it gets around to the end person, it's not even close. And I'll give you an example. We've had clients that say, my house is contaminated. And after talking to them for a little bit and learning about the, the, the details, you find out that somebody went out there, took a tape lift, say that, said that their house is contaminated and that's, that's a qualitative sample that you're, you're trying to ID something that you see, but that doesn't exactly translate to average exposure. So the flip side of this uh, is, is, you know, on one end, you have people who miss a lot because they don't educate. They don't talk about the limitations of the testing, what it can detect. Did you guys know that a spore trap sample doesn't identify a lot of fragments? Did you guys understand right. that spore trap sampling does not identify mycotoxins if you're even worried about mycotoxins? And again, right topic. Yeah. Um, and then you, the, that other extreme, of course, is that they're saying that their whole house is destroyed and you get a lot of other feedback, which is, 
this guy came in or this girl came into my home and found mold on the windowsill and, and basically says, I need to bulldoze the house down or sell it, or it's going to cost forty fifty thousand dollars And there's just, there's just kind of a, there's a, only a few of us and it's growing who I think really try to be balanced and not oversell or undersell an exposure and how we avoid overselling and underselling is following the science and, and, following the studies and being consistent and not misreading the studies and, and, and implying that they're stating something that they're not, uh, that sort of thing. So I think, I think the takeaway for me with what you're saying is that certainly health and diet play a function. Uh, I never thought talking to you today that you would say, um, you know, eat pizza, it's the way to go. Um, but that a healthy diet stands to protect you against in even ambient exposures, things that you have very little control over. Um, why is it that some people can go outside and they feel okay, but that another person in the same front yard can't, they don't feel better, they feel worse. There's, there's a lot of other things that are going on that are outside of your control and diet, I think, plays an important function on the IEP role. It's a matter of saying, you really need to understand that we're, we're looking at the details, we're looking at um, low dose exposures. So you don't have to have 10 square feet of mold on a wall to say, now there's a problem. If it was nine square feet, it wouldn't be an issue. But 10 square feet is an issue. It's, it's understanding that a lot of the people's exposures, when we walk into their home, it's not staring you in the face. Your problem in your home was not staring us in the face Yet, you could argue that it was a source of potential exposure for you and your family. It's not like I walked into your house at two, three years ago and there was 20 square feet of mold on the wall. And I think a lot of the more traditional IEPs miss that. That's what they're looking for. And if they don't see that, they report to their client and they say, there's no problem, you're fine. Exactly. And that's, again, not, not to make too many uh, parallels here, but that's what conventional medicine is looking for. They're looking for advanced disease states you know so if you go into the doctor and you're not like you're not dealing with a clearly defined uh serious disease then you you you're told that you're fine and i can't tell you how many times that's happened um to my patients before they come to see us and the problem with that of course is that uh the sooner the earlier that you intervene when there is a problem, the easier it is to fix. Ben Franklin famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, but like in the context of disease, if you think of a spectrum where let's say over here is full-fledged type two diabetes with kidney failure, and over here is perfect blood sugar. Well, if I get someone who's like closer to this end of the spectrum or even you know pre-diabetic level, there's a really good chance that if they follow my advice, they'll, they'll avoid ever getting diabetes in the future. And right. they'll save themselves a lifetime of medication and hospitalizations, et cetera. Whereas if somebody comes to me when they're already over here and they've lost beta cell function and they're insulin dependent, they're, you know, I can, I can help, but I'm not going to be able to take them all the way back to having normal blood sugar at that point. So, it's kind of the same because we're on this whole parallel yeah, thing. It really yeah. is that connected a dot with me. Uh, same issue of it's not just about a, a water leak. It's also about prevention with homes. Uh, think of it, the health of the home. Um, we're talking about maintaining moisture levels in the home, having better drainage, being around the home, around the perimeter, um, being cognizant of things like basement and crawl spaces and being proactive so that, you know, using your analogy, if you can stop and prevent it on the front end, uh, not just the, from a cost standpoint, from, from an exposure standpoint, you can prevent a lot of things that kind of creep up and sneak up uh, into Absolutely. your life. And yeah. all of a sudden now you're, my average out-of-state client right now has at least spent $50,000 in, in a combination of medical-related costs and or remediation testing. And I have three that are of over half a million. And, 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 and it's, and, you know, the years. Uh, and it's the typical story. You know, it's multiple physicians, uh, uh, you know, that didn't take them down a direction. Maybe it was a more tradi – I don't want to pick on every um, – conventional medicine, and you made a good point, by the way, I just want to say that again in this book on conventional medicine, you, you acknowledge a lot of the good things that con conventional medicine has done for us, including things like, you know, um, the ability to go under, under the surgery, under the knife, and you just, I forgot the chapter, and I have it highlighted right here, but it's, it's just, you, you talk about it's a long-term impressive of achievements, you mentioned antibiotics, yeah. vaccines, um, just, it goes on and on, but I think the point is, is that just because that fits a model for major acute issues and treatment. 
a lot of people miss the boat about the stuff that can sneak up behind you. And then by the time they identify it, it is that stage two. It is that, it is that far end. And now they're throwing their hands up in the air. And, and then the last component of this, of course, is the emotional part. I mean, I end up being a counselor 80% of the time with what I do. Uh, because there, it's hard to appreciate for all you spouses out there where, um, let's say your partner is the one who has the chronic illness and you don't, mm-hmm. and, and they hear you talking and through your own emotions and fear, um, they don't hear the, the truth of, of your illness. They just hear the fear, the oversell, and there's actually a problem going on. And so what ends up happening well, other than a fight or a divorce, they don't go anywhere and the problem continues to get worse. And with me, an example of that is say, for example, a crawl space that continues to get wet, a wall that continues to get wet, um, the spouse that is in disagreement with the other one, that means they don't agree that there's a problem, starts buying furniture, the furniture gets contaminated, now there's an argument about whether they should keep it. Folks, you got to, you got to, you got to do, and I know you're trying, you got to, you got to get the education and you got to talk to people like Chris. You can go on IEP radio and learn more. I have a ton of references that you can use to educate your partners or your loved ones and friends so that they have a better understanding of what you're dealing with. This is not an acute, this is not getting hit by a bus. So. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I definitely learned that from you in terms of the, the home version of that, where you know, when we moved into our new house and after we dealt with the mold issue that did exist, we, you know, I, in, we installed a dehumidifier and we have a whole house air filter and, you know, we have a number of systems in place now to prevent problems from occurring before they even occur. So now, if, you know, because we maintain a lower relative humidity, if we do have a water leak, um, there's, you know, it doesn't mean we're fully protected forever, but it means it might be a little less likely to, to, for mold to happen, you know, at, at 45% relative humidity than 65% relative humidity. So um, we've taken a lot of these steps for the same reason that I eat well and exercise and try, you know, try to get seven to eight hours of sleep a night, you know. It's, right, exactly. It's, and it's even if it's like, it's like you said, even if um, you, you're, the leak did occur and maybe you're maintaining moisture levels in your home. It doesn't mean that it's a guarantee. There's not a problem, but your radar's on too. You're aware uh, of your surroundings. Um, you're not making a mountain out of a molehill. You're just paying attention to the many things that we've almost written off as, well, that's not an issue when maybe it is. Um, maybe in summary, and certainly if there's anything else you want to add, that's, that would be welcome. Um, I think the takeaway here is it's a balance. Uh, we, we learn that health, uh, lifestyle, diet, uh, you made some great points in the beginning about how, you know, we don't eat the same way. We don't sleep the same way. Um, we were a lot more active going back far enough. All these things play a role in how you protect your body, your temple, um, and, and how that sets you up for success in a lot of ways, um, in, including ways that obviously have little or nothing to do with uh, your exposure to an indoor environment. But we also know um, from a, an IEP perspective that the environment can trigger um, negative responses depending on your body, depending on what's present in your home. And so it's this balance of saying, well, am I getting, am I eating right? Am I dieting right? Am I, is my, has my home truly been looked at if it needs to? I mean, this is under the assumption that you're not getting better right now. This is under the assumption that you think you have a problem, by the way. Yeah. Um, but that it's a journey. It's not a race. That's the other issue is a lot of people, especially in today's age, feel like just like we all want stuff right now. Like we just want to press one button and, and everything's going to get better. And it doesn't work like that. It, doesn't, it, it certainly doesn't work like that with health, as I've learned. And it does not work like that even with a remediation project in your home. Um, so people listening who've never been through it or are going through it um, know that this is not anything new, that it, it's, it takes time to make things right. Um, and it's a lifestyle change. Um, uh, the people that I work with today are mainly folks who suffer from some chronic illness, some chronic disease, and their lifestyle is, is just different from the person who apparently has all the right things going for them and they can smoke all day long. I think you made a reference to that in a recent podcast with Joe Rogan about, you know, you got somebody smoking, they're a hundred years old and you know, they just got lucky. It just worked out in their favor, but I don't think that's worth the odds are for, for most people. Uh, so that being said, um, Chris, any last words, um, points to emphasize for the audience before we go? Um, 
No, just that I, I think, you know, when you think of what's important for health, like the basic things, um, I would put indoor air quality pretty high on the list. Uh, I, I mean, that's even more true worldwide where you have uh, people in the developing world, um, you know, cooking with uh, wood inside their house and, yep. and the, the serious threat to health that that poses. But even in the, I think we, we've, we've come to believe that that's just a developing world problem. And it's not, you know, we don't have to worry about indoor air quality in the developed world. And we of course know that that's not true. I mean, if you think of something like, yes, we eat three times a day or more or, or fewer, depending on what your, your preference is, you know, we're drinking water throughout the day, but we're breathing every moment. <laughs> And so when, when, it, when it comes to thinking about what are some of the big levers that we can push that would have a big influence on our health, I think making sure that you live, that live in an environment where it's safe to breathe the air is pretty high on the list. So that's, that's why we, we spend so much time uh, talking about this with our patients. No, and it's funny because when you talk about that third world stuff, uh, I know, again, it's not every case, but you kind of are talking about more uh, acute exposures. Somebody burning wood in a confined space or a hut creates an enormous amount of a, we'll call it a contaminant cloud that they're exposed to creating almost immediate consequences. Um, and, and then you can kind of taper out if you read some of the world studies that are out uh, where they're looking at like PM10 uh, particulate matter yeah. at 10 microns and things. And yeah. you see different uh, countries and whatnot. Uh, China is a big one. Um, and all of these things. Yeah, you're right. We, we do have a lot of things going for us in, in, in the United States, um, but we, we live in boxes and boxes build things up. And when we thought that we got it made because, hey, let's lower our energy bill um, by making them tighter, a lot of homes left um, ventilation or the indoor air quality component of it behind because it's an inverse relationship. The more fresh air you bring into a home, the more you filter the air, the more energy you're using. That's not what they were aiming for when they wanted to lower utility bills. And this is, I only see this 99% of the time. In fact, I get a big smile on my face whenever I walk into a client's home and they actually have anything that's proactive in terms of you know, fresh air or, or to whole house filtration. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance of working together between health and home. And uh, I think that I tell you what, coming into this, I learned a lot more than I thought. The takeaway too, and I, I feel like I need to go sign up is as the health coach thing that you were talking about because I'm not, I'm not just saying this. I, I really feel like, you know, sometimes we get numb uh, to a, a flow and a process and I, I know that I do a good job and I know I can do better. And I think that um, I need to learn more about this health coaching part of it to see whether or not I want to wear the actual cap or do like you suggested as another option and is bring somebody else in who's already qualified uh, to provide that service. That's, that's, that's great advice, Chris. Mike, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, same to you. Okay, well, until next time, huh? Absolutely. All right. of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician.